Hi everybody, in this video, we're going to take a look at what it takes to move an element to the position of a mouse click. Now, I know that seems really straightforward, but as we'll see shortly, there's some little tricks and roadblocks that get thrown in the way that we need to account for so this effect works properly as expected. So before we go on, let's take a look at what exactly I'm referring to. So here is an example of what we'll be creating. We have an element, and then I have a yellow circle in the middle, and notice that when I click anywhere in the background, the circle follows the position of my mouse click. And notice that the way it moves, it's actually not a sudden change, it actually animates, it actually bounces back just a little bit and then accelerates forward. So a little nice touches there that we're going to be implementing ourselves. So this is the effect that we're going to be creating. So let's take a look at what it all involves. So at a high level, there are four things we need to keep in mind. So the first thing is very obvious. We need to calculate the mouse click position. You know, that's something that anybody could have told you that one. The second one is the one that gets a little tricky and we'll look into that a little bit later, is that we need to adjust the position that we calculate for any offsets, margins, and padding. And this has to do with more of how layout is handled in HTML. And this is where more of the complicated code that we need to write will come from. And then the last two are pretty straightforward. First, we set a transform to move the element to the click point and we'll use a translate 3D function for that. And then we'll use a transition to animate the movement of the circle from where we where it is originally to the point of our mouse click. So with that, let's go ahead and start looking at our code. Okay, so now we're in our code editor. In this case, my code editor of choice is Adam. You can use whatever code editor you prefer. And what we have is a very simple starting point for the effect that we want to create. So you can see a preview of our page as it is right now. You see the same container we saw earlier. You see the same yellow circle as well. Now let's look at the markup behind it. So our HTML is pretty simple. We have two elements here. We have one div called content container. Then we have another div called thing. And the thing item corresponds to the circle itself. And the content container is the, is the enclosure, is the box that our circle is currently contained inside. And our style rules right now, nothing too crazy is going on here. They all deal with just the appearance of both of both of these elements. The content container has a fixed width and height, a border, and we're just saying overflow is hidden to clip our circle and it gets to the edges, so it doesn't look like it's flying outside of it. And then we have some background color and a, and a pointer property, pointer value set for the cursor property. Nothing crazy here. And the thing is literally it's just, a, it's just a yellow circle. You know, you have a width and height of 75 pixels, there's a yellow background color slightly darker yellow for the border, and the circle is actually a trick I'm using with the border radius property by making it 50%. You can change that value if you want more of a rectangle or a rounded rectangle. You know, feel free to go crazy with that particular item. All right, so here's our starting point. We have our elements. So the first thing I have to do always in these kind of cases is, you know, we have our script tag, we write some JavaScript. And the first script I like to write is the, the variables that now point to the HTML elements in our page. So let's get started with that one. So I'm going to create a variable called var the thing, and it's going to be document that query selector, and we're going to pass in the selector syntax for the for the thing item we have in this area, which would be hashtag thing. Okay, and let's just do a similar thing for the container itself as well. So var container equals document dot query selector. Okay, spell it correctly, and then call it one hashtag content container. All right, so we have both these variables defined. So the, the next thing to really do is, let's go and set up our event handler. So I want to set it up so that when someone clicks on the, the container itself, we are able to process a click event and then take it from there. So the way you add an event listener is the same way. You use add event listener, you do container dot add event listener. And I'm gonna call my event click, which is the easy one, and the event handler is gonna be called get click position. And it's it false for the, you know, the bubbling argument. And all right. So right now, if we were to click around, nothing's going to happen because we haven't defined the get click position event handler yet. But that's an easily solved problem. It's the function get click position e for the mouse event argument. And there you go. So here is where we now specify our code that is now going to at least start us on the path for getting our circle to move to the point of the mouse click position. So the way we're going to move our circle is by using a transform, and more specifically, we're going to be using a translate 3D function that will be assigned to the transform property. So let me just give you an idea of what that looks like. Let's go back to our CSS, and let's set an initial value for the transform. Right now, our circle is in the top left corner. Let's go and fix that by just setting transform, translate 3D, and let's specify a value of, you know, let's say 50 pixels, 
50 pixels and the Z value is going to be zero because we don't want to do anything that way. But like I always mentioned before, the translate 3D function allows you to get hardware acceleration, which is as always a great thing to have if your device can support it, which almost all of them do. And if you want smooth animations, which we will ultimately get when we're moving our circle around, you want to stick to something that's hardware accelerated. All right, so translate 3D, it takes three arguments and by doing what we've just done right now, you can see our circle has been offset a little bit. All right, now let's get back to our code. So now what we're really gonna do, right, is calculate the X and Y position of our click and we essentially create in code the equivalent of the transform property that I specified in CSS. And that is pretty straightforward, just a little painful you'll see in a second when we actually generate the string entirely in JavaScript. So, all right, take click position. So let's start first by specifying a variable called x position, And I'm gonna set it equal to, in this case, the properties that your event handler provides, your mouse event provides for the click position, and that is client x. So x position is e dot client x, and then the y position is the equivalent e dot client y property, which is the vertical version of client x. All right, so we have these two variables specified, and the client x and client y properties are not the perfect choices for this, at least in their current state. And the way I'm gonna do this is by explaining to, you know, refine the position of our click as we look through various examples because the code is gonna be much longer than what I'm gonna show you right now, but I don't wanna overwhelm you right now either. So let's start with what seems like a straightforward solution and then gradually ratchet up the complexity to get the more final, more precise solution that we, that we want, that we deserve. All right, so now we have this and now let's go ahead and specify the translate 3D value, so we can generate this little string here. So I'm gonna create a function, a variable called translate 3D value. And here, this is where the painful part comes in that I was alluding to earlier. I have to generate this entire string that you see here, except this time using the values for X position and Y position. So it looks kind of like this. Translate 3D value, translate 3D, close parentheses, you know, close the, the arrow, the angle of what is that word called? Parentheses, parentheses, wow. I can't believe I spaced on a very simple word like that. That doesn't bode well for the rest of this example, now does it? All right, translate 3D plus X position. And now we need to add the pixel value in it as well because it needs it. And now we need to specify the Y argument. So now plus Y position plus pixel. And now we're actually at the point where we're placing the Z argument we're going to do zero in quotation mark. Okay, so what you have here now is a version of this value where in this case, the 50 and 50 that I had in CSS are now replaced by the values returned by the X position and Y position variables you're seeing right here. So this is, hopefully this code looks right. You know, there's no error checking just yet, but you know, running code is the ultimate way of knowing whether something works or doesn't work. A partially tongue in cheek comment there. All right, so now that I had a translate 3D value, all that really remains is to assign that to the transform property on our element. So that is done by using the thing dot style dot transform and setting it equal to translate 3D value. Okay, so, so far if this was all done right, if I were to click anywhere in this container, the circle will follow the mouse to that position. All right, this is good, this is good. I mean, the position is a little off, you know, and we'll get, that goes back to, you know, making the positioning from E that client X and E that client Y a little more precise, but at least we are getting in the right direction. At least we are now moving the circle to the point of our mouse click. There's no animation or transition here, and that's okay for now. We will slowly, you know, add that towards the end. I know that the animation is cool, but the more important part is to get the position just right. Okay, so as we saw right now, the position of our circle isn't precisely to the center point, of where our mouse cursor is. Ideally, you know, I click here, I want the center of my circle in the, both the horizontal and vertical position to be at the point of the mouse click. That is the goal at least. And so the first thing is, uh, it's kind of subtle, but it makes sense when you think about it. The, our circle is a, is a development and it's essentially a square. You know, the bounding box is gonna be a rectangular square. And the zero, zero position of that particular square is at the top left corner, like where my mouse cursor is right now. And what we've done right now is say, just move the circle to the position of zero, zero in its little weird world. And that means the top left corner of the circle is now going to the position of the mouse click, which is why you see the effect that you see here. So what we need to do is take that into account and shift the movement of the circle by, by its center position, which would be half its height and half its width. And so that means we're going to modify our client X 
you know, calculations here in this line to take into account half the width, and then the client y will be calculated, will be modified in a similar way, where we take into account half the height. So e to the client x, and now I'm going to do the thing, which is the JavaScript representation of the circle, dot offset width divided by two. So I'm subtracting that value from the x position calculation. And then for the y, we're going to do a similar thing, the thing dot offset height divided by two. Okay, so right now we modified our code for calculating the position by moving it by the center values, so moving the point that moves it closer to the center. So now when I click it, notice that now a circle is better positioned. I mean, it's still not perfect. You can see that it isn't quite centered where it needs to be. It's like, you know, maybe a few pixels off. And that goes into what we're going to look into next, which is the, the positioning of things. But before we get there, though, let's, you know, go back to something a little bit more fun than dealing with positioning. Let's go ahead and add the, add the animation, the transition. So what we want to do, like I mentioned, is we want to animate the circle moving from where it is right now to the position of the mouse click. And the way we're going to do that is by very easily specifying a transition. And this transition is going to have, you know, we're going to be animating the transform property. Let's have it run for a duration of 0.3 seconds. And let's give it an easing function. Let's give it an easing function with ease in. And now notice that with a very simple change, we now have our circle moving to the position of where we clicked or close enough to it. But the ease in easing function isn't exactly the best choice for this example. So let's go ahead and do something that I've shown on the website before. Let's generate a new easing function that makes this work. So the website I'm going to show you again is cubicbezier.com. And I've mentioned this before in that it's a great place to basically experiment with different easing values and seeing like what gives you the effect that you want. So what I want to create is something that is a little bit more quirky. Like let's say that, you know, that's a little too quirky. Let's speed it up a little. Let's start, start off, let's have it back up a little bit and then speed up very quickly and gets towards its destination. So something that looks a little bit like this. And okay, you know, that's, that's different. It's not quite the same as the example I showed you earlier, but we'll live with this for now. So I'm gonna go and copy this value in and let's go and specify it as part of the cubic Bezier arguments. So let's replace ease in, bye bye ease in. So cubic Bezier and let's pass in the values for this particular easing, find all the control points. And I'm gonna stick with for spacing. So I'm gonna add the spacing properly. Okay, so now let's see what this effect looks like. It kind of has a, a little jerky motion where it's like, you know, do I really want to go there? Do I not want to go there? But then bam, it goes there. So that's cool. And you know, we can play with this more, but that's not, you know, that's not the key part of what we're trying to do right now. Okay, so now we have our effect mostly working, right? The thing that is still annoying though is the positioning. Notice that we're not centered properly here. And the thing that makes it more complicated is that right now I have my, my content flush to the top left corner of the page with the offset being kind of off because I have a border on the container. That's right, the border specified on our container is actually what's causing this, uh, the circle to not be perfectly centered at the mouse click. But let me go and give this page a padding. I'm gonna padding at 50 pixels. So now everything shifted over by 50 pixels horizontally and vertically. And now let me click. Now notice that the position is off a whole lot more. It's not even you know in the same ballpark where a circle is. What's going on? So this is where the, the layout issues in HTML and the lack of a proper API in JavaScript for dealing with this kinda, you know, kinda collide. The E the client X and client Y properties that we're using right now to calculate the position of something, they only take into account the position from the top left corner. They don't take into account any changes in positioning caused by borders, caused by paddings and margins and other various things that you're gonna have in a real life situation. And the thing is, you need to do the calculation yourself. Now, it's not the worst thing ever. In fact, yeah, I know, I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna talk about in great detail how to do that. I actually wrote this article a while ago called Getting the Mouse Click Position that essentially talks about the challenges of how to calculate the mouse click position and what all is involved and the solution for it as well. And I even provide the code snippet for it. I'm just gonna take a look at the code snippet. We're gonna paste it in right now and I'll just walk through it very quickly, but I highly encourage you to read the longer article on this so that you have a, a better idea of what exactly we're dealing with. But the code snippet looks a little bit like this. Let me paste it in here first. Okay, so the function is called get position. And you know, right now it's pasting the function isn't gonna do anything, I need to actually use it. And what this function does is you get an element, in this case, we're gonna pass in the element of our container, and it calculates all the various things that are going in that have it be positioned where it is. And those things are, for horizontally, it's the offset left property, the scroll left and client left, 
and for why it's offset top, scroll top, and client top. And it's not just that particular element's own offsets, it's that element and every element of its parent hierarchy in the DOM. So what we're doing is we are going from where the element you're at right now and walking up the tree up to where you can no longer go further and calculating the offsets all along the way. We're turning an X property and a Y property that give you, okay, here's our calculation, here's where we are right now, offset it by this much so that we get the value that we're really interested in going with. And let me show you how it is used. You know, the explanation for it is more complicated than how we actually use it. So the way you use it is I'm just gonna say where, you know, parent position equals get position, that's a, that's a function we just pasted from the article I showed you earlier, and passing in the value of container. Okay, so now that we have this, all I'm gonna do is continue enhancing our values for calculations for x position, y position, by now subtracting parent position dot y, sorry, x for client x position, and minus parent position dot y for y position. And so now when I click, what happens? Notice that now our circle moves to the exact point of our click because e that client x guesses a position that is relative to the top left corner of our particular client area, which is you know the browser view, view, viewable browser window, and then we get the offset by the center position, which is the x and y of where the circle is, the center point is, and then we offset it by the position of the parent itself, which is calculated by parent position. So there you have it, a very quick overview of how to create an effect that involves moving an element to the position of mouse click. And like, like I started off with, right? I said, this is a very easy thing to do, right? You know, you just, you, you know, once you figure out the property on animate, which is translate 3D and it's a transform property and you get the mouse positions in client X and client Y. It should be straightforward, but the thing is, the APIs in JavaScript aren't quite there yet to help you make some of these things more straightforward. And you know, there are always third party libraries that help you to do this, but the code is essentially eight lines of code. So why add 40 or 20K of third party libraries and dependencies when you just write the code and try to figure out what's going on by yourself. And once you do that, you get a, a perfectly functioning effect for how to create something that moves to the element click position. All right, so with that, if you wanna learn more, go to crew.com where I have a bunch of articles and videos on animation topics, JavaScript, and other fun stuff that web developers might find interesting. If you have any questions about this or anything else you run into, please feel free to post in the forums at forum.crew.com where I and others will be happy to help you out. And you can ping me directly on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube. I'm pretty quick about responding to things, so feel free to ping me. And if you found this particularly interesting, if you like watching videos to learn about stuff, you might like reading about them like people did back in the day. You know, I have plenty of books out there on various topics in both Kindle and paperback form. So click here if you want to check some of those things out. And so with that, we reached the end of our time together on this video. If you like the effect that you saw and you think others would benefit from it, by all means, please do tell your friends and enemies about it. Word of mouth is the primary way the content here gets shared and spread and promoted. So every little bit you can do to help is very helpful. Now, if you want to be notified of updates to the YouTube channel that you're currently on, hit subscribe so you can be notified very quickly on new content I'm creating or comments that I'm making. If you want to be notified of little things that I found on the net that are kind of cool and web developer related, follow me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm fairly active on those networks, so by all means, go ahead and follow me on them and see what see all the cool stuff that I'm doing or, or not doing. And lastly, you know, buy a book. You know, buying a book is a great way for me to sustain a lot of my random hobbies and and interests. So, for example, one of the things I'm trying to do right now is build block. You know, you probably heard of the space elevator, right? I'm trying to use blocks to go all the way to up to space. And the, every book you buy helps ensure I buy more blocks so that we can build a space elevator that we've been promised for decades now. And my goal is to make it a reality using these blocks and every book you buy helps make that reality get closer to actually happening. All right, guys, see you guys next time.